Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jose Francisco, Project Manager at the IAS USA. Today's webinar will be going over COVID-19 vaccines and the viral variants, new aspects of COVID-19 research. I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Mark Mulligan from the U New York University Grossman School of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Mulligan. Hi, Jose. Thank you very much for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I wanna thank the organizers for inviting me to come and talk. Um, I'm really looking forward to this very timely topic and uh, to responding to questions at the end and leaving plenty of time for those. We have a few introductory slides from IAS USA. This slide has information, uh, some of the information about CME. Uh, this presentation is CME eligible. And these are um, the credits that it's been approved for, and you can uh, have more information that which will be uh, sent to you. Uh, of course, we want to save our uh, thank our um, grant support for supporting this this wonderful opportunity, and um, the supporters are listed here. Thanks to all of them. Um, we will have some poll questions. Um, a window will show up, um, you can choose a response and then we'll show you the, uh, the responses. Um, and then um, on the bottom half of this screen, um, you'll have a chance at the end or any time to submit a question and um, Jose and Donna will be helping me uh, as, as we go through those, sorting them out. So um, please um, look for the Q and A button, put in your name and uh, email and then your question. So with that, we'll get into the talk. Um, so COVID-19 vaccines and the viral variants. Um, it seems like as each week has passed, uh, as we approach this talk, this topic's become more timely. So we have some learning objectives. Um, we hope that at the end of the webinar, you'll be able to describe the challenges for uptake of COVID vaccines, discuss the platforms and the reasons boosters may be necessary, including either for vi variant viruses or for waning immunity or both, and uh, identify reasons for supporting vaccine globalism. That is the need to vaccinate as many humans on the planet as, as possible, as quickly as possible. All right, so let's start with a pretest question. Um, what is the dominant viral variant currently circulating in the United States? And your options here are alpha, beta, delta. So the poll is open. Please uh, click on your response. All right. Um, interesting. Interesting. We have a split, and I, I think I understand why. So we're going to we're going to get into this um, in just a minute. Let's go to one other question. Um, question number two here at the beginning. Which of the following is a valid reason to check for spike antibody levels in a vaccinated patient? So a valid reason uh, to find out if your patient is protected, to find out if a booster shot is needed, research, or because your patient wants to know. So again, please click on your answer. And here's the result. Um, very nice. We have a, a bit of a spread, uh, but uh, many of you selected research. And uh, I think we'll be making these points as we go forward. OK, thank you for that. So I thought I'd start with what we and I have been through at, at our vaccine center. Uh, and then uh, this will kind of, in a way, review what's happened in the uh, pandemic vaccine research. We started in May of 2020. So, you know, 14, 15 months ago, uh, enrolling in the phase one for Pfizer, an industry sponsored trial. And then uh, that proceeded to 
phase two and then phase three, and we participated all the way through. In July, um, we started the, the phase two, three, um, and then um, we expanded uh, and opened up four satellites around the New York City area. And I'm showing you those here. We, we are funded by the US government, NIH. We're a VTEU, uh, the, the COVID-19 prevention network, this network of networks who respond uh, efficiently to pandemic uh, prevention needs, vaccines, monoclonals. Um, our clinics are in Manhattan, uh, three of them, one on Long Island, one on Brooklyn, total of five, including the VA in Manhattan and uh, Bellevue and New York City Hospital also in Manhattan. And so we opened those and then in September started enrolling in the Operation Warp Speed NIH AZ phase three trial at all five of our sites and ultimately enrolled uh, nearly a thousand participants in that study. And um, in February, then we uh, began enrollment in the Sanofi phase two trial. And uh, now we just last week, Friday, started a booster study. And we have another booster study we're starting, as well as a study in pregnant women and um, uh, breast, breastfeeding uh, women and so forth. So we'll tell you a bit about all of these things as we go forward. But one of the points I'd like to make is that. We've worked with each of the three major platforms. So there's the RNA lipid nanoparticle platform. Um, uh, and I should have CureVac here, which is another um, company that has an RNA lipid nanoparticle vaccine. The protein plus adjuvant platform. So we worked with Pfizer, then Sanofi, and then the uh, recombinant non-replicating adenovirus platforms. And uh, we've worked with AZ, but there's of course J and J, which has an EUA, along with Pfizer and uh, Pfizer BioNTech and Moderna. And then there are many other platforms right now, including uh, whole inactivated um, vi recombinant viral vectors that are replicating. Uh, there, there are other um, uh, Sputnik V, uh, for example, uh, is, is an adenovirus uh, heterologous prime boost. China has a recombinant adenovirus as well as their whole inactivated. Um, and so we worked in all three of the major platforms so far. And now we're studying boosters, duration of immunity, special populations like compromised hosts and uh, transmission study um, and more. And we'll talk a little bit about these. I won't belabor what I think you know already that the, the first two EUA approved vaccines are um, strikingly effective. Um, the Pfizer-BioNTech lipid nanoparticle vaccine, there were 170 infections um, um, in the final efficacy that was reported and 162 were in the placebo, only um, um, eight in the vaccine group. And I said infections, but really these were symptomatic COVID cases one week after the second vaccine. So 94% effective and it was true in older adults, all races, ethnicities, um, and uh, particularly also true for both mild and severe disease. Um, I won't show the data because it's very similar, almost identical for Moderna. Um, this is AstraZeneca, uh, another study that we participated in and uh, papers now near ready for submission. Um, uh, hopefully an EUA will be going in before long. Um, it's the vaccine that's being used most in the world. And um, there were 190 cases in 32,000 participants at 88 trial centers. Um, and the vaccine was well tolerated. There were no safety signals in the, this trial of 32,000. And uh, there was 76% efficacy against symptomatic COVID, 100% against severe and critical disease. And in those who were over 65, 85% um, efficacy. So. Again, a, a very uh, effective vaccine uh, as well. I wanna make the point about the global perspective, vaccine globalism. So here we are in the US, we have a population of 330 million, 0.33 billion. That's only 4% of the population of the planet of 7.8 billion. And as long as there are infections anywhere, we remain at risk here. So there's a self-interest self 
aspect here. That is that um, although we may uh, have a very low number of cases now, you know, having come way down since the beginning of 2021, um, there are a lot of hot spots around the world currently where there's an awful lot of viral replication, which leads to um, random errors in the RNA uh, coding sequence, which can lead to changes in viral behavior and uh, variants of interest, variants of concern. So there's the self-interest aspect because we want to stay down here. We don't want a really bad variant to, um, that maybe avoids vaccine protection to arise. So we really have to um, vaccinate the world. And there's also the, the, th the moral side, it, you know, it's the right thing to do. We are all fellow citizens on earth and uh, we all deserve to share in, in the advances that have been made uh, in, in fighting this infection. So I'm gonna turn a little bit to um, some of the results uh, and how this ties back to um, the possible need for boosters and variants, et cetera. So I'm showing you here um, uh, an example. This is from my lab. Um, it's an immunofluorescence-based micronutrilization assay. These are Vero E6 cells. So they express the ACE2 molecule, the viral receptor. The blue cells are uninfected. Um, and the green cells have been stained with a monoclonal against the nucleocapsid and they've been infected. So it's a monolayer in 96 well plates. And we can look at, um, for an IC50, uh, you know, the, the uh, dilution of sera or plasma that can reduce by 50% the number of infected cells. And that's basically how we, we do the assay. In this case, with the original US strain, the, the Washington strain from January of 2020, but um, uh, also this can be done with variants. And there are many other takes on this. This is our version of, uh, of a live virus neutralization assay. Okay, so let's talk about some definitions. Uh, so all viruses change over time, particularly RNA viruses. They, they um, lack proofreading or have very little. Um, and most of the time there's no impact on the properties of the virus. Um, but some changes do affect the properties of the virus. And, and those are now being called variants of interest or concern. The interest are compared to the reference isolate, the genome has mutations and it's um, being transmitted and it perhaps is in multiple countries. So that's a variant of interest. The variant of concern as defined by WHO and now CDC uh, meet these criteria. So mutations are established, they're causing community spread, they're in multiple countries and they have significance for public health, either increased transmission, increased virulence, or decreased effectiveness of some of our medical countermeasures like vaccines. And there's a third category, the variant of high consequence. So thank goodness, currently there are no uh, high consequence variants identified, but these have all of the um, variant of concern features and they're clearly demonstrated to cause failure of diagnostics, a significant reduction in vaccine effectiveness, or a disproportionately high number of breakthroughs, reduce susceptibility to therapeutics, um, or more severe disease. And thank goodness we don't and hope, hope we won't have one of those. Along with those definitions, we have new naming uh, conventions, and I'm sure you've noticed this in the last few weeks. Uh, we're now using the Greek alphabet to identify alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and so on. These are the variants of concern that WHO has identified, the major ones. Um, so this is alpha, it's the UK variant. And uh, this one is the current uh, dominant um, strain circulating or variant circulating in the US. So that's the answer to that first question. Um, beta is the South African variant. Um, 1351, there's uh, gamma, which is a Brazilian variant, and then there's delta. And this is the Indian variant. And, and about an equal number of you suggested it was the um, most common variant. And maybe you were looking forward, forward thinking, because it's going to be very soon. And we'll talk more about that. 
So those are the variants of concern um, with their, their new um, uh, letters. This is a paper that uh, we have submitted to a journal and it's available on bioarchives as a preprint, just making the point that compared to the reference strains, um, uh, the UK variant uh, has a similar IC50. So this is now a different neutralization assay in Ned Landau's lab, our collaborator. Um, and this is um, Pfizer, this is uh, Moderna. We're looking at IC50 with a um, pseudotype lentivirus pseudotyping the, uh, the lentivirus with the different spikes for all of these variants. And the point I wanna make is here's alpha. It's really not very different. So the UK is, is susceptible, whether it's Pfizer or Moderna uh, to vaccine serum neutralization. Um, here is the uh, South African variant, beta. And you can see it's fourfold down in terms of its serum neutralization susceptibility. And then this is delta and it's about fivefold down. And these really are the same. Uh, they're not statistically different, Pfizer versus Moderna. So we see about a, a, a five-fold drop uh, for uh, Delta in terms of vaccine uh, serum neutralization. Now, I think what I'd like to say as well is that um, the vaccines can handle it. Um, in, in many, uh, most cases, we have a cushion of a magnitude of our our circulating antibody um, and uh, certainly our other cellular responses. And we'll talk about T cell responses. So the vaccines are able to handle this. Neutralization is just one part of the integrated immune response that these vaccines are generating. Uh, this is a 3D image uh, from that same preprint um, showing you the spike protein uh, trimer in blue and then a single receptor binding domain. And these are a couple of the mutations that occur in the Delta variant that are um, felt to be important. Um, and uh, here, if you look at the wild type um, full length spike, here's the cleavage site. So this is the S1 ecto domain or, or um, surface protein, if you will, sort of the equivalent of GP120. Here's the GP41 membrane spanning. Uh, protein equivalent. Here's um, the um, transmembrane component, and then this is the cytoplasmic tail. There's a fusion peptide. So it's, you know, conceptually a lot like what you're used to thinking about with GP160. And then this is the, so this is wild type, which is going back to the Washington strain. And then here's the Delta variant, and you can see these in blue, these um, key mutations that seem to together land it um, um, it's um, changed properties in terms of neutralization sensitivity. We also know that obviously this variant is much more highly transmitted. So there's a mild decrease in neutralization sensitivity, but about a five to seven fold or 50 to, uh, let's see, 50 to 70% increase in transmission has been estimated. And this will depict that. So here's what's the latest about uh, the Delta variant, the Indian variant on the uh, CDC website. This is note though from two weeks ago. And what we know is that every two weeks uh, for the last uh, month or two, this has been doubling. So it was at about 10% uh, two weeks ago. We know now that uh, the Delta variant is about 20% of proportion of new infections occurring in the US. And if it doubles again in two weeks, we'll, we'll be at 40%. So it's really uh, skyrocketing. The other thing is that it's gonna hit, it is hitting and will hit unvaccinated people um, much more uh, than vaccinated people. Since, as I said, we have a cushion of antibody, most vaccinated people handle it just fine along with their T cells. And if you look at US counties by the percentage of people vaccinated, and then the number of cases per 100,000 residents um, as of the end of a week ending June 22nd, you can see that if 60% of the county is vaccinated, there are just two cases per 100,000. Whereas uh, if you're in the zero to 30% county, you have a threefold higher number of cases. So very clearly um, vaccination uh, and the variants are in a foot race in the US and globally. And, you know, sadly, many countries globally, they're in single digits in terms of vaccination coverage. Um, you probably know that 
Uh, President Biden set a goal of 70% U.S. Uh, adults 18 and over uh, being vaccinated by the 4th of July. We're not going to make that, but we'll be close. Um, and um, having said that, we have to keep in mind so many countries that are nowhere near that. So there's a lot of work to be done. Here's a, across the top, a quick look. If I could draw your attention up here at a glance, U.S. latest data, about 30. 34 million cases, uh, 600,000 plus deaths. You can see just a little uptick here in the last week or two, perhaps reflecting what I'm talking about. Delta's rise, um, uh, and particularly in unvaccinated individuals. And then uh, I just want to make the point that right now, you've seen this, I think, in, in, in uh, reporting, hospitalizations and deaths are almost all in the US occurring in unvaccinated people. Um, uh, it's pretty uh, dramatic. Um, so these are preventable hospitalizations and deaths. So we really have to continue to advocate and I ask you to do that. Uh, we're at 66% of adults with one vaccine uh, and we have uh, as a country now across the board, moderate uh, level of community transmission. I just thought this image was interesting. It's just showing you for the different age groups uh, cases coming down uh, since the beginning of this 2021 year um, here in 75 year olds and vaccines going up. In the 75 and older, we're now at about 90%, um, at, uh, at least single dose coverage, and um, uh, which is what's shown here. Uh, you know, we're about 50% in, in middle aged, uh, and, you know, the 12 to 15, the vaccine has just been approved. Uh, we have one vaccine for that age group, Pfizer. Um, same one vaccine for this age group, 16, 17 Pfizer, but Moderna uh, also has data and they'll be, um, I'm sure, getting their EUA for those younger people soon. I'm not going to go through this, but just to show you, these are the variants of interest. And again, uh, an alphabet soup of Greek letters um, for a variety of variants that have fixed mutations that are now being uh, circulating in, in communities and transmission is ongoing and have been identified in many of these cases in multiple countries. So these are all being watched very closely. So I just wanted to show you again, um, this is our neutralization assay, one of our patients who got, um, in this case, a Pfizer vaccine a week after uh, vaccination. This was somebody with no history of uh, prior COVID. Um, they really don't have much uh, reduction in the numbers of green uh, cells uh, as opposed uh, to fully diluted serum or, or the absence of serum uh, uh, control well. But after their second, uh, just before their second dose, um, uh, you can see there's, there's starting to see reduction. And then a week after the second dose, uh, pretty dramatic. And out here, this is a titer probably of uh, several hundred IC50. So the point I'm really trying to make here is that this second dose really does a lot for people that have not had prior COVID and it's very important. And, and we know from some of the data from the UK and elsewhere that in, in, in fighting uh, Delta, uh, second dose vaccination, very important. I wanted to show you some other data. These are, again, our neutralization assay over here. Over here, ELISA binding antibody against the S1 um, and this is neutralization of the Washington strain. And just showing you that in unvaccinated, uh, people without a history of COVID, um, COVID naive individuals who get vaccinated um, on the day that they get their second shot, so 21 days out, uh, if it's Pfizer, 28 days out, if it's Moderna, and, and really both of them look the same. We've compared them in the same lab, same assay, and they're, they're virtually identical. Um, you know, you get a tighter, a binding antibody of about uh, 10,000, we'll say, um, and it goes on up uh, over 100,000 after the second dose, a month after second dose, and it's holding pretty well um, here three months after the second dose. If you look at the um, neutralizing antibodies, in this case, we'll show you again that people without a history of COVID, but look at the people with a history of COVID. They have some baseline before vaccination uh, residual antibody, and they have quite a boost with a single dose. The single dose um, doesn't do a whole lot. Here we are just prior to the second dose. So three weeks after first dose, if this was Pfizer, 
And um, you, you know, really by a week after the first dose, you're up here with um, neutralization IC50s of, uh, in the range of 5,000, 10,000 10, or higher. Whereas you're down here, uh, your neutralization tires are, um, you know, 100 at best. But then the second dose really makes a big difference and you get tires up in the range of several hundred or even a thousand in, in many people who are naive. Um, it's interesting to see at three months after the boost, um, the experienced people in this relatively small sample that I'm showing are, are holding. And, and I think the naive people are holding uh, uh, pretty well too. Uh, if you compare naive and experienced, there is a statistically significant difference. The p-value shown here between naive and experienced in terms of the endpoint titer for the binding antibody. We, we sort of saw that here and here we've done a statistical test and there's the result. Then I just thought I'd share, this is an interesting experiment that um, Amber did in the lab showing that um, the avidity, uh, the tightness of antibody binding to um, the S1 protein in the ELISA format uh, using a, a six molar urea um, dissociation uh, to, to look for avidity of binding. Uh, you see the much higher uh, avidity uh, uh, here after the first dose in people with prior COVID compared to those without. But notice they're coming down. That's because the vaccine is probably inducing new epitopes, um, new target antibodies targeting new epitopes. And so you're, you're diluting out the, the um, more mature antibodies that were providing high avidity uh, pre-vaccination. On the other hand, there's no pre-vaccination antibody in the naive people in yellow. Uh, and then when they get their first dose and then a second dose, you can see they continue to rise as they're, they get repeated exposure in germinal centers, go through additional antibody maturation, somatic hypermutation, germinal center reactions. So it's interesting to see the sort of diverging directions there. And these are two people that had COVID that we had followed for you know eight, nine months, and then they got their vaccine. So these are experienced individuals, just two individuals showing you that the antibody response in, a, in an experienced individual to the vaccine is actually much higher than what they had in response to the virus way back here, you know, at week three, four after onset of symptoms. So very dramatic. Again, these are the IC50s, uh, you know, here uh, probably 50,000 tighter um, uh, and, and a quite strong tighter here of several thousand. So stronger responses uh, after vaccination than initial infection uh, if vaccination follows infection. Very importantly, we can't um, forget about cellular immunity. So this is just an example of activation induced markers in someone who's received uh, one of the RNA vaccines in our lab. And here we are uh, looking uh, at CD69 and CD200 and uh, the double positive cells are very low uh, at baseline. After an initial vaccine, they go up, and then after the second vaccine, they're even higher. And this sort of displays that here in one individual, here in a small group of individuals. Can't really say much about, in, in this small sample, any difference between the naive and experienced individuals for these, in this case, CD4 uh, T cells um, who are responding to peptide stimulation with uh, 15 MERS overlapping by 11, uh, spanning S1. And this is a really interesting paper. Uh, uh, it's a preprint currently that came out recently that shows that if you had uh, a vaccine or an infection, you are able to recognize variants um, just fine. So if you look at spike uh, T cell responses to spike peptides, um, for CD4 or CD8. This is the reference original strain. These are uh, four different variants, including um, uh, the UK variant, Brazilian variant, uh, South African, um, and uh, the California variant. And you can see there's no, no drop off. So um, when you look at CD4 and CD8 T cell responses, with, either from natural infection or from vaccination, um, and look against alpha, beta, gamma variants, um, you, 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 know, you see very nice responses. So T cell reactivity is maintained against the variants, uh, even though there is some diminution in antibody, uh, neutralizing antibody as we talked about. So this is very encouraging and may explain why if you have a uh, vaccination and a get infected, 
um, perhaps with a variant, um, maybe there wasn't quite enough antibody to prevent infection, you do mount uh, a cellular response that protects against severe disease. So I think these T cells are a key part of the strong protection against severe disease and death of these vaccines. Okay, so we'll go into a slightly different topic now. This is getting into um, what we're learning in the EUA era about groups that were excluded from uh, the phase three trials, as for example, people uh, who are immunosuppressed. So this is a patient uh, of ours uh, who's a 69 year old with multiple sclerosis. He's on uh, anti-CD20 monoclonal, a B cell depleting drug. He got two doses of an RNA vaccine and had no binding uh, in, a, in our bench top ELISA in, in the research laboratory. Uh, in my lab. And then he got a third dose through clinical care and we were able to uh, look at his uh, responses after and he made no antibody after. So then the question is what now? Um, and so cocooning, making sure everybody around your immunocompromised patients, your severely immunocompromised patients like this one who may not respond to the vaccines, um, uh, make sure everybody in the family, all of their contacts are vaccinated. If they do get infected, certainly uh, early monoclonal antibody therapy, um, non-pharmaceutical interventions. In other words, sure, take the vaccine, but maybe act as if you're unvaccinated if you're in one of these categories. Um, and, um, you know, we need more clinical research. And really, this is the answer to the second question. Um, we, we don't know... Um, you know, what the correlative protection is. The, the, um, the commercial antibody assays are not authorized to look at responses after vaccination to tell if someone's protected. You know, they don't assess functional antibodies, um, ADCC, neutralizing antibodies. They certainly don't assess those CD8 and CD4 T cells that I just showed you. Um, so it may well be that this B cell depleting drug, uh, there's maintenance of, of T cells, for example. So uh, I guess food for thought, starting with that case. Now here's a series of um, MS patients who actually became infected at our institution uh, in that first wave back in March, April, uh, May of 20, when it was so bad in New York. And um, again, this is infection now, not vaccination as on the last slide. Um, and um, they had antibody and T cell assessments about seven months after their infection. So, you know, in 2021. And what we found was that their T cell responses were actually similar, whether they were on a, a CD20 monoclonal treatment or not. Um, however, the B cell responses were quite different. The uh, average IC50, if they were on a B cell drug, was about 50 as compared to about 350. If they uh, uh, had recovered from COVID, an MS patient, but they weren't on the, a B cell depleting drug. And you can see that here. So there may be some of these individuals uh, who, you know, who are able to make antibody despite being on the B cell depleting drug. Um, I'm sorry, over here, um, but many of them are not. This is actually no antibody at all down here at that bottom line. But the real point I wanted to make here is that the, the T cell responses in this look post-infection um, uh, in, in a colleague's lab at NYU were uh, preserved. So, and clinical disease was not different. Um, again, suggesting T cells protected them, although antibody may have not been uh, the usual. This is just from uh, early phase work, uh, BioNTech Pfizer vaccine, just showing again that, that that modified RNA lipid nanoparticle vaccine really produce nice CD4 and CD8 T cell responses. In this case, um, the interferon gamma Eli spot, uh, peptide specific uh, responses. And you can see them here for both CD4 against the RBD after vaccination uh, and CD8 after vaccination. Um, this is just a, a paper that's out now uh, again, looking at a B cell depleting drug in a group of multiple sclerosis patients in Israel in this case. And again, just showing you that relative to untreated MS patients or to healthy subjects where the uh, commercial assay spike antibody was way up here, there's most of these um, B cell depleting agent uh, patients are way down here. So this is a group that um, 
you know, is not making antibody uh, like others, but may well have preserved T cell responses. Here we go with organ transplant. So somebody who's on um, an, an anti-metabolite, mycophenolate, also on tacrolimus, um, no history of COVID, um, got two doses of mRNA and had a low titer of binding antibody. Again, this is in our lab. Their new titer was right at the limit of detection, about 20, so very low. This individual through clinical care obtained a third vaccine. And afterwards we had the opportunity to study again and now the ELISA had gone up to 10,000 and the new titer had gone up about fivefold, close to 100. Um, what we don't know is the durability of this response. Um, we are, uh, I don't have the cellular data in this individual, some preliminary information about this, these drugs, which um, attack B and T cells are that the T cell responses uh, are down. It may be different than the CD20 patients. Um, but with, this is a healthcare worker who's a transplant, and uh, I have a few of these. Um, is this individual now protected with, with that profile? Um, well, we need a correlative protection. We don't know the threshold magnitude of response required for protection. Um, um, T cell is important to look at. Um, this individual got um, uh, heterologous. Uh, boost. So the, the priming was with two RNAs and then they got a J and J. So would a, would a third Pfizer, you know, have done the same thing? We don't know. So again, the answer to many of these questions right now are more clinical research is needed. Uh, and this is just showing you, you know, again, somebody who was a bit of a low responder after their second dose, their neutralization titer was about 108. Um, this individual, um, um, arranged and got a third dose, and their their new titer went up to 830, which is in the you know in the range of what we see with uh, people without a history of COVID uh, after two doses uh, normally. And this this was uh, someone who um, was a bit older and um, had a somewhat lowish initial response and was able to get a third dose. Here's that transplant pa patient I showed you a minute ago. That single case initially was 20, no neutralization and went up, I don't have a picture of uh, the wells, but went up to a, a third, uh, to about close to 100 um, after a heterologous J&J &J third dose following two Pfizer's. And this is um, solid organ transplants. You're familiar with this work probably. They initially published in JAMA one dose of vaccine, and this is after the second dose. And in essence, showing you people that um, uh, had a response to the first dose came up after the second dose. If they didn't have a response to the first dose, they're in orange and many of them stayed quite low. Um, and, and you can especially see that uh, here in the anti-spike uh, antibody, 46% had no antibody. So these are solid organ transplants on typical immunosuppressive uh, drugs, including um, uh, microphenolate, tacrolimus, and in many cases, steroids, a high percentage of these were on steroids. So this is again, a special population like the ones I showed you earlier, uh, uh, collagen vascular disease patients, MS patients on immunosuppressives, that um, uh, it's concerning that many of them are not making antibody. Um, they may not be making T cells to the same level. And uh, that's something that we're in the process of investigating now. So um, this same group, I believe it was the same group, gave, uh, well, they, they had, uh, solid organ transplants, 30 of them who got a third dose, sort of like the, the single case I showed you earlier. These folks had low or no antibody after their primary series. They got a third dose. They reported receiving a third dose. So somehow they got a third dose. And um, after the third dose, there were six people who initially had low antibody after their primary series who developed high antibody. Again, this is all just commercial assay, spike binding antibody. Of the 24 that had low antibody, two thirds actually remained negative and a third developed uh, either high or uh, low antibody. Um, the vaccine was tolerated as a third dose. Um, limitations of the study, again, this is just commercial binding um, antibody, um, no neutralizing antibody, no cellular immunity reported. So these are limitations. It's not that they're not there, but they're not reported. They may not be there. Again, same thing, more research is needed. And that's what the authors of this small case series said that you know, this should um, uh, inspire more research in this area. And I think it should. 
Another example in immune-mediated inflammatory disease patients, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, um, in, inflammatory bowel disease, who are either um, not on methotrexate, but have those, one of those conditions, or are on methotrexate, and comparing to uh, healthy controls. And if you just set an arbitrary level, let's say of 10,000, and, and this is um, the ELISA from our lab as being adequate since most of the um, uh, controls are here in healthy people, 90% um, of the uh, non-methotrexate patients uh, met that, but only 75%. In other words, 25% were below uh, all of the controls except one. And this is a replicate um, cohort who've got, got very similar data. So um, one of the things we've proposed here, you have the luxury with some of these conditions of holding immunosuppression for a couple of weeks. It's very uncertain or dangerous perhaps to do that for an organ transplant recipient. You don't wanna endanger that precious organ, but for some of these um, inflammatory uh, diseases uh, that can be done. And so, uh, there are data that that works for flu vaccine, that if you hold methotrexate, for example, you can get a better response a couple of weeks before, week after. We've proposed to NIH doing a study like that, and we're, we're um, hopefully um, uh, going to be doing that. We don't know for sure yet. Okay, so that's sort of an update on uh, some of the special populations. Uh, certainly pregnant women, we're getting information confirming the safety of the vaccine uh, now. Uh, and then, of course, children, many, many, many more data in children now than we had with the original phase three trials when pregnant women and children were excluded. So here's where we are now in the U.S. We have sufficient supply um, and uh, we're continuing to vaccinate. But, you know, at our peak, we were vaccinating um, three to four million people a day. And now we're down to about 600,000 a day in the U.S. and going down in many places in the world there over here. They haven't had a supply and they're still coming up. Um, so we're over here, most of the world is over here. And you know some countries are, are here in between like we were a few months ago. Uh, so this is kind of the picture of where we are. We've got 66%, I think I said, of adults uh, with a single dose. So we've got to keep pushing uh, to try to get as high as we can. Um, we don't know exactly what the herd immunity threshold is, but uh, certainly higher is better. And uh, I hope all of you will be vaccine advocates and continue to educate, patiently address and answer um, our, our patients' questions about this. Because vaccines don't save lives, vaccinations do. A wise man, Walter Orenstein has uh, always said that, one of my former colleagues at Emory. Um, and it's so true. Uh, the vaccine in, on the shelf or in the vial doesn't do anything. We've got to get these things into our patients' arms. And that takes education and it takes trust. Uh, this next study uh, done by uh, my colleague in the Vaccine Center at NYU, Dr. Ellie Carmody, points out that um, physicians are the most trusted source. Physicians and other healthcare providers, um, culturally relevant physician groups in this study and Orthodox uh, Jews in, in uh, Brooklyn, um, uh, trying to address issues about uh, vaccine uh, and COVID uh, in some of, some of the um, uh, populations where uh, uptake may not have been the highest always. Uh, so I'm, I guess I'm making the point that this study and many, many others have shown that the healthcare provider, the doctor, the nurse, uh, the pediatrician are the most trusted source for our patients. So it, it really falls to you to, to try to help uh, continue to educate every patient encounter. I hope bring this up. Are you vaccinated? Uh, and let's talk about it a bit. If, if, uh, if not, if you have questions and tell me what's going on. Um, so this is, uh, you may have seen me show this slide uh, before, but this is out in uh, the East River, uh, just east of Manhattan, on Roosevelt Island, where it was the smallpox hospital. Um, and now it's a beautiful wreck thanks to a vaccine. And, and, and this is what we're hoping for, um, that we can uh, really make a, a major difference. So let's come back to where we started. And we're moving uh, to the close here. And um, we'll go to the questions and answers after that. So again, what is the dominant viral variant currently circulating? Um, so go ahead and cast your vote. And uh, we'll 
We'll count those votes up here in just a second. Alpha, beta, or delta? And there we have it, look at that, uh, great job. So the UK variant, um, as of two weeks ago was about 70%, uh, it's now probably down to 60% or so, still our dominant variant, but uh, Delta coming up fast, 20% um, uh, in the last week or so, and we'll probably double in the next two weeks and then double again, and probably a month will be our dominant variant. So this, will, this answer will change uh, going forward. Okay, uh, let's go to the second question. Which of the following is a valid reason to check for spike antibody in a vaccinated patient? To find out if protected, uh, to find out if a booster is needed, research, or because they want to know. And I think uh, many of you got this correct the first time around. We will tally up the votes here in just a second. I think I made this point three or four times as we went through the uh, particularly the special populations and um, uh, duration of immunity and, uh, you know, whether we'll have protection against um, emerging variants in the future. Okay, let's tally it up. And here we go. Research. Absolutely. So about 80%. Uh, and that is the correct answer. We really need more research. We don't know what we're doing. Uh, you know, in some ways, uh, FDA and CDC do not recommend that we check uh, these commercial antibody assays in our patients after vaccination because we don't really know what to do with them. They, uh, you know, it's not known. Um, they're not authorized for that. Um, we, you know, we don't know what the correlative protection is. They, they are very limited. Look at a complex immune response. Okay, um, we'll continue. So I'll wrap up by saying progress has been excellent. Uh, we have um, multiple um, genetic immunization and protein platforms in the genetic immunization. It's both the uh, RNA uh, and uh, the uh, recombinant adenovirus, um, but we really need to enhance global vaccination. So I think we can celebrate these extraordinary vaccines. They're all highly effective. Uh, but we need to enhance global vaccination. And then there are a lot of unknowns. Um, the duration of protection, will we need a booster for waning immunity or to protect against a problematic variant? Well, we don't know. It looks like the variants that are currently circulating are handled largely by the vaccines. If you're vaccinated, you will be protected, certainly against uh, severe disease and death, and um, uh, in, in, in most cases against infection, I think. Um, but, you know, over time, that might change. Really good news about T cells that I showed you. Um, that, uh, and of course, we'll have memory B cells uh, that are uh, the T cells are effective against the variants in in, in vitro assays. Um, hopefully, soon from the the phase three trials, we'll have a correlative protection. Um, we we are learning more. I think that the vaccines do prevent asymptomatic infection, maybe 65, 70 percent and perhaps prevent transmission um, uh, makes sense. If you're, um, well, first of all, if you don't get infected, you're not gonna transmit, but if you get infected, if you shed for a shorter period of time, if you have a lower viral load, um, if you're less ill, coughing less, um, um, reduce uh, transmission. And, and there are studies that are being designed now uh, to look at that. Um, there are studies being, so the transmission study, it was called the student or college study by the CoVPN, and uh, we're participating in that study, looking at young adults who get vaccinated and then do swabs to try to identify asymptomatic infection uh, and then look at their uh, close contacts around them for transmission. So uh, the first study designed to look at transmission is, is ongoing, very important study. Um, we're also, as I mentioned, doing the mix and match study which is uh, heterologous or homologous uh, late boosting. And so we'll have information about uh, boosting should uh, it become clear that we're gonna need to do boosting. Um, Long-term safety, um, you know, we're now 14 months out from the first humans to get COVID vaccines and uh, both short-term and long-term safety have been excellent. Most vaccine uh, related uh, uh, effects, 
side effects will occur er early in the first uh, few days, the sort of mild, uh, minor inconvenience kinds of things, those expected reactions and uh, other problems generally would occur um, in the early days, not really late, be very unusual. Um, would compromised hosts vaccinate from the third dose? Well, we talked about that, need to do more research. Uh, and when will we have herd immunity to really put this pandemic away? And I would say we're a long way from that. One of the things I wanted to say was that this is not over yet um, with the need for global vaccination and the variants uh, that are um, emerging. Challenges include vaccine uptake, so community engagement, education, trust in science, participation in clinical trials. Uh, the logistics has to be made easier for access for people to get to vaccines. And the US has done a lot for that. Uh, global vaccine equity, we talked about. Uh, the situation with freezers is, I think, a little better for some of the newer vaccines and um, uh, formulations with RNA may improve and make that easier. Um, and we need to stay ahead of the variants. So we've got to survey, do surveillance with genomic sequencing. We're not doing enough sequencing to track the variants. So that's a, a must. Um, and finally, my request to all of you is to be a vaccine champion, a vaccine ambassador or advocate. And remember that vaccines don't save lives, vaccinations do. I want to thank the team at NYU that has done a lot of the uh, work that we've done. Um, uh, and this is Amber and Marie and Ludo in the BSL-3, where we do our live virus microneutralization assay. Uh, we have many collaborators. And of course, we thank our study participants who made uh, all this human work, translational work possible. Um, thank you for your attention. And um, with that, I, I'm going to put this up and remind you that you can submit questions using the Q&A button. And I will go turn off my pointer and um, stop sharing my screen. And, and again, thank you for your attention. So I'm opening up the Q&A, so I understand correctly. That's how we will proceed. And um, I'm seeing um, a number of questions here. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I'll just start with this first one. Um, how, does, how long does RNA last in tissue after vaccine? So, you know, it's a matter of days or a week, um, maybe a bit longer. Uh, I think we're still learning that, but it's, um, it's degraded just like all RNA is in the body um, uh, over time. So probably a matter of uh, a few days to several days uh, based on the available um, uh, animal data. How many amino acids of the spike protein does the Pfizer vaccine include? Uh, well, there are roughly 1,200, and it, and it includes all of them. It's a full-length um, spike mutation. There are a couple of mutations and prolines that um, lock for, for both Pfizer, Moderna, uh, j, &J um, uh, that lock the uh, stabilize the pre-fusion configuration. So that's been a key, uh, really key development um, for this immunogen. Another question, can mutations in the virus decrease the infectivity as mutations in the virus is for survival of the virus itself? So yeah, that can happen. And that would be a, you know, sort of a, a replication crippled virus and would be less likely to compete. So it'd be a selective disadvantage. And, and those, uh, those mutations would not likely survive. They would be outcompeted over time by other viral variants. Um, how long after COVID infection should vaccine be given? Well, um, you certainly want symptoms to resolve. Um, CDC says you can wait up to three months. So because since uh, post-infection, a uh, few people seem to have secondary infections in the first three months. I usually recommend waiting about a month after resolution of symptoms. I, I like to have the <clears throat> uh, effector cells, B and T lymphocytes that were induced by the infection contract down into memory. Um, we know from in the world of vaccinology that the longer the interval between a prime and a boost, and that's really what we're talking about. The, in this case, the infection is serving as the prime and the vaccine series as the boosters. Um, so waiting a month or so, uh, I think is kind of a sweet spot. You could wait a bit longer. If you go sooner than that, you may not uh, get as good a response just because you're not perhaps fully not contracted into memory. 
Here's another question. I have a patient who received one dose of AZ overseas, now in the US, wants to get Pfizer. Would it be safe? And if it's safe, do they need two doses or just one? Um, <clears throat> in other words, counting the AZ as the first dose. This comes up fairly often. Um, people are starting to travel a bit more. Um, and um, we, we don't have a lot of data on this, but I think it would be safe, my personal opinion. I've had many patients who got AZ and then uh, decided they wanted to get uh, one of the EUA vaccines. And I think this individual would like and would probably um, be fine to have both Pfizer doses uh, because then they can get you know, the paper. <laughs> well, it's very important to a lot of people to have that CDC card um, that's uh, fully filled out and won't have any questions. Uh, another question, the SOT study by Werbel reported a case of rejection in a heart transplant recipient after a third dose. Can you comment on how serious this was? Yeah, so this is something that um, our transplant group is, is interested in studying. Um, I, I don't know the specifics of that case, but I'll just say that um, there are um, um, profiles of anti-HLA um, antibodies, responses that, that are measured to, to look at uh, you know, the possibility of rejection of, of a future transplanted organ, for example. In many cases, that's what it is you're trying to um, not mess up a future chance to have another transplant if it's ever needed. But when I talk to the transplant docs, they tell me this is not a gigantic concern for them. It, you know, the, it's something that'll be studied. Um, it is worth studying if there are individual patients that already have a number of uh, anti-HLA um, responses, you know, it might be more concerning. Basically, you're, you know, this RNA is a self-adjuvanting um, stimulation and would you trigger some uh, uh, immune responses against the, the transplant? Um, I think this is something that, again, needs more study. What is the available evidence assessing these patterns of post-vaccination protection on people living with AIDS less than 200? So uh, unfortunately, very limited. Um, we're talking about severely compromised. I'm, I'm finishing reading the question uh, due to AIDS, uh, not those who live with HIV and have say CD4s over 200. Um, a few of the phase three trials did include HIV CD4 over 200. And uh, the limited information there suggests they tolerated it. It was safe, tolerable, and they made responses that were similar. Um, people uh, with CD4 under 200 and HIV were excluded uh, from the phase three trials. And so those data are um, yet to be put together, I think. Um, so uh, really we don't have the answer to that yet. However, I will say that uh, I think it's a situation like with transplant patients, like with compromised Rheumatoid patients make sense. It should be safe. These are not live viral vaccines. These RNA vaccines, or even the J and J, the three EUA vaccines in the U.S. That J and J vaccine is a non-replicating adenovirus. No concerns about safety, really, from my personal point of view. I think it's very reasonable, uh, even pregnant women as well, to, for them to receive uh, these vaccines. Um, Okay, what dose of methotrexate equates to significant immunosuppression of antibody and cellular? I, um, uh, I think we have generated that data with my, you know, I'm an ID doc, my, colleague, my uh, colleagues in those studies who are the rheumatologists would be able to answer that. Unfortunately, I cannot. I would, could refer you to, we have a published paper and some of that data may be in there. Uh, it's in the Annals of Rheumatology and uh, the first author is, I believe it's Cher, but you can, you can find S-C-H-E-R. Um, oh no, the first author I think is Haberman, or you could use my name because I'm in there as well. Um, are there any data on patients currently on chemotherapy? Um, you know, again, same answer. Um, I think that um, common sense might argue that that might not be uh, you know, if it's going to be a limited duration, maybe wait if you can, sort of the timing issue about reducing immunosuppression that we alluded to earlier. Uh, I'm not aware of, of data on that, but certainly uh, we need more uh, such data. And I know that for many patients that, you know, the course will be long and the desire would be to get them protected. Again, I think their non-pharmaceutical interventions, masks, cocooning them, everybody around them getting vaccinated, 
probably won't hurt for them to get the vaccine. Uh, I just don't know data and they, they may be less likely to respond compared to uh, later, but um, should be safe. Another question, when you mentioned treatment naive versus experienced patients, are you referring to patients who had COVID uh, treatment previously? Uh, if I said treatment naive, what I meant to say was COVID naive versus experience. So these are people with or without a history of COVID. And the point was that if you had a history of COVID and got your first dose of vaccine, you really make a strong response to one dose. Whereas, uh, and, and you do get some additional benefit, although more less so with the second dose. Whereas people with no history of prior COVID, you, you really have to have that second dose to get that strong response. Okay. Um, so what about gamma? Uh, does AZ have efficacy, mRNA, uh, J and J? Will gamma reach the US? So gamma is South Africa, B1351. It's been less than um, 5%. It's, it's hovered there. Um, um, so it's already reached the US, but it hasn't really taken off. Um, and uh, the, uh, some of the vaccines have, uh, there's a study out of Qatar, Qatar, that suggests that the RNA vaccines have um, pretty high efficacy against the South African variant um, gamma. Um, some of the other data, um, uh, it's a little more mixed. For example, one of the protein plus adjuvant vaccines, Novavax, but they had uh, a small group in South Africa with a number of HIV infections, and they had a high number of uh, the uh, gamma infections, and they were less uh, less effective there. I think it was more like 60%. So um, it's it's a little bit mixed. Um, um, AZ, I'm trying to remember and I want to be careful here. Um, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say something that might not be right. I'm just having trouble remembering for sure about how it did, but uh, certainly that's something that we can look up. Uh, I noticed that in the study on the Orthodox community, uh, it didn't include pharmacists um, most accessible professionals. Could you please comment on pharmacist role? Oh boy, absolutely. In many states, pharmacists uh, vaccinate. Uh, and when I, you know, I did try to include many, when I spoke, healthcare providers um, and, and say healthcare providers trying to be all inclusive. So absolutely. Pharmacists are uh, a, a, a huge part of, of this because, you know, the vaccines, I mentioned trying to make it easy to, for community members to get the vaccines going to one of the local pharmacy chains is uh, really convenient. Uh, I used to get my flu shot at the, um, you know, at the pharmacist. I could roll grandma in there in her wheelchair and get hers and I'd get mine at the same time. So um, it's, a, it's a great place and absolutely pharmacists have a big role. Um, another question about effectiveness in clinical aids and it's the same answer, unfortunately. These, uh, uh, were excluded uh, from uh, CD4 under 200. Um, only those with stable disease and preserved CD4 uh, were allowed in the phase three trial. So I, I'm not aware of those data. I think that those are being collected now. Uh, another question, should there be an mRNA um, vaccine booster for patients who got a single dose of J&J &J or another type of vaccine? Well, you know, those people are fully vaccinated. Um, they got a single dose. And that's all that you get with that regimen. And that's all that's needed. And it's, you know, highly uh, effective and, and very safe. Um, I think the question could be, will we be giving boosters for any of us who are fully vaccinated, whether it's J&J &J or mRNA? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't limit the question to J&J. &J, and I would just say that we don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, you read that many experts are saying we're probably going to need them. And I think you could argue that it's possible or probable that we will need boosters, but I don't know that it's certain. There's a, an interesting paper out in the last week or so published in Nature from um, one of my colleagues, um, uh, Ali Elabedi at WashU, looking at the germinal center reactions after RNA vaccine. And um, actually they did fine needle aspirates of lymph nodes and even uh, five weeks after second dose, um, very active, strong um, uh, uh, germinal center reactions ongoing um, with uh, um, spike-specific 
uh, B cells. Uh, so, you know, uh, and the and the breadth of those responses uh, as they continue to mature will probably get get better. Uh, we you're getting more somatic hypermutation over time. So I think there's a lot that we have to learn still with the T cell responses, germinal center reactions, the quality of the B cell response, and I don't think it's for sure that we're going to have to have uh, boosters. The one thing that would, in terms of duration of protection, because of the strong memory that we may have, high quality memory. On the other hand, if we, you know, this is coming back to the need for uh, vaccine globalism. If we get a really problematic variant in terms of vaccine protection, then that might be the reason we'd have to perhaps come back with a variant specific booster. Um, in other words, instead of being, let's say, five-fold less susceptible to serum neutralization, um, if we had a variant that was 50-fold less susceptible, you know, that, that might be a, a problem. On the other hand, maybe the T cells would still protect us against severe disease, and, and it, um, it wouldn't, wouldn't be a problem necessarily for people to have a bit of a mild disease. So uh, we just don't know yet. Uh, let's see. Are there any data on patients with a history of CLL and not on meds? What is the efficacy of the vaccine? So there may be some, I just don't know it and I apologize. Uh, do you have any data on correlates of protection with the Chinese or Russian vaccines? Uh, there are published reports of significant infections in Africa among previously vaccinated people. So, you know, we, we certainly are having breakthrough infections everywhere. The vaccines are not hundred uh, percent and, when you vaccinate, you know, hundreds of millions of people, as we now have um, globally, uh, a bit over a billion doses have been ad uh, administered. Um, there, there will be breakthrough infections, you know, even for vaccines that are 95, 90, you know, 85, 80% protective. And, um, uh, I lost that, I'm sorry, I lost that question. We advanced it and I forgot the second part of the question. So I'm embarrassed to say, let me see if I can go to answer it and see if it's there. Um, uh, I probably have lost it. Maybe it's under the dismissed file here. Now at the bottom. Um, yeah, anyway, I apologize. There was a second piece to that question and uh, I lost it, but hopefully we'll circle back around to it here. Um, are there efficacy and side effect available data available on combining um, or co-administering uh, SARS-CoV-2 and flu? Yes, I just saw in the last week uh, the first um, work that I've seen on that, and it suggested that it was safe and that the flu responses were just as good, whether given with or without um, COVID, and then that there may have been a little, if I recall right, maybe just a touch of reduction in the COVID, but maybe not significant. So a small initial study, um, and this is something that obviously is, is being thought about. If we're gonna have to go to boosters, might they be um, given at the same time, two different arms perhaps, or would a manufacturer, um, you know, if it's the same platform, combine them? Um, so we're starting to get some data and those, those are important studies. Um, um, the second part of that question, will seasonal COVID vaccination be recommended by ACIP? And I think ACIP, although I'm not on ACIP, would say, we don't know yet. We're not recommending that at this time. Uh, next question, do you have any data um, on correlates of protection? Oh, here was the one I, I missed. Um, yeah, so that was it, the correlates for Chinese and Russian. So you know, there are a couple different Chinese vaccine. There's a killed vaccine. There's a um, uh, adenovirus vaccine. Um, and then uh, the, the Russian vaccine is a heterologous prime boost, ad5, ad26, uh, non-replicating adenovirus that's called Sputnik V. Uh, I don't have any correlates data for any vaccine. Um, I wish I had them for the RNA vaccines. Um, I think those data are known. Uh, in some circles, and we should be hearing about it pretty soon. Um, that's what I'm being told. Um, okay, could you comment on the J and J in reference to durability? Uh, and 
uh, activity against alpha variant. So uh, UK, what, uh, what uh, reasons may explain a less robust response from adeno versus RNA? Yeah, well, um, you know, in some ways, you, you really can't compare. Um, the, the studies were done in different populations, the RNA and the uh, J and J, uh, the uh, uh, AZ. They were done at different times, maybe circ different circulating variants. So it's tough. It's tough. Uh, it's not comparing apples and apples because the, you know they weren't designed to look head to head like that. So um, you know, I, I would just say that we know that you know both uh, both of these platforms are highly effective and and um, uh, that the 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 risk versus reward the the benefit of vaccination outweighs any risk of, of very rare side effects and uh when there's circulating virus um and and um really if you have a choice there might be reasons you know depending on your profile to choose one or another but uh if you don't have a choice take whatever you can get and these are all highly effective and very safe vaccines in the middle of a pandemic um okay um how worried do we need to be about Delta? Um, well, yeah, you know, it is a worry because we have a lot of unvaccinated people still and they're, they're at risk for um, illness. Um, I, I mentioned that unvaccinated people make up the vast majority of hospitalizations and deaths that are ongoing in the US and, and you know, most people around the world are unvaccinated. So uh, it spreads, um, 50% faster, it's thought, um, uh, than the virus it's replacing, the alpha or UK strain. So this, this Delta variant, um, it is something that I think um, we should have appropriate concern about and really push, again, we have a tool, the vaccine, and we really push this tool uh, and use it. Um, yeah, um, cases are going up in several countries, absolutely. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's a little concerning to see that, you know, we just kind of in the US feeling like we're getting back to normal and now we have this coming. And so um, you may have seen, or you will see that WHO has recommended that even vaccinated people globally keep wearing masks. So that was new yesterday. And, and, you know, you can sort of understand that if most people are unvaccinated globally, it, it makes some sense. Our CDC is still recommending if you're fully vaccinated that you don't need to do that. Um, I would just say maybe keep your mask in your pocket. And if you feel you're in a situation uh, that warrants it, um, it's, it's good to have it available. Uh, but uh, I'm certainly not wearing it um, uh, like I was a few months ago. Uh, being fully vaccinated. But I, you know, I'm thinking about it a bit more and, and things may change um, somewhat sadly. Um, so how soon do I think booster requirement studies would be finished? Uh, I think we just have another minute. We're coming to the 715 hour. So I might take just a couple more. Um, so yeah, the, you know, we're, we're now giving boosters to people that were vaccinated roughly six months ago in the clinical trials that we're doing. Uh, and they'll be in one of the studies we're doing, there'll be a control group that gets a placebo. And so over time, we'll be able to watch the waning of the response in the people that got the placebo and compare that to those that were boosted. In the boosted group, we'll be able to watch the, determine tolerability, safety, um, and um, you know, what's the immune response? Do they get a, a nice boost? And does it really send their you know, the longevity of this response uh, to a new level. So um, it, it sort of depends, and it's kind of guessing right now, how, how long we have to study the need for um, um, a booster will depend on, well, do we have a problematic variant that's really bad emerge? Or do we see in the studies that um, we're starting to get a lot of breakthrough infections in the in the group that got the placebo. Ultimately, since we don't currently have a correlative protection, it's gonna be seeing those breakthroughs in vaccinated people in an inordinate number that will tell us that uh, vaccine protection is, is not there either due to waning and, and we can look at the immune response to you know, see if it's waning uh, or to due to a variant. Okay, and maybe I'll make this my last one. 
do you know how much longer it will take the FDA for full approval of Pfizer and Moderna? Uh, this may increase willingness to get the vaccine. And, you know, I think that's a great one to end on. I think that uh, it's it's got to be close. You know, they uh, they're reviewing it, and um, uh, you know the the safety really has been extraordinary. Um, uh, the protection has been extraordinary. They've got their six month follow up data in, and uh, I. I would hope that it'll be in the, in the very near future. And I do think that when they have achieved full licensure, as opposed to this emergency authorization, it will take us into a slightly different sphere, including with the possibility that we'll start to see more um, requirements for vaccines, more mandates, um, which I think is something that, you know, in, in the U.S. has been at times controversial, but it's something that we've done a lot in our history and uh, makes, could make a lot of sense in the, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, to do that. So uh, I think with that, uh, I see there are several more questions and I wish I could get to them. Wow, there's a lot more, but I want to thank the audience and I'm going to um, uh, stop talking and turn the stage, thank all of you for the great questions and for your attention, turn the stage back over to um, Jose and Donna. Thank you, Dr. Mulligan. As a reminder to our audience, evaluation and information on how to claim continuing education credits will be emailed by 5 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow, and this will enable us to review all of those that have attended today's live broadcast. A list of upcoming available webinars for sign-up is on our website, and three additional webinars have been added for August and September. To register, please visit our website. A new ISUSA website feature practice question of the week is now available to help our audience stay informed of the state of the art practices for HIV, COVID-19 and other viral infections. This will appear as a pop-up on the ISUSA website whenever you visit us. And you may also access this on the resources section of our webpage. Please save the date for the 2021 annual Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Clinical Conference, which will take place from Sunday, October 3rd to Wednesday, October 6th. For additional information, please visit our website. Lastly, if you are interested in other COVID-19 programs, we have our on-demand dialogues available. Lastly, we'd like to thank our presenter, Dr. Mulligan, and to the audience for your participation. This concludes today's webinar.